Potter's Hand. Good morning, Potter's Hand. Good morning, Potter's Hand. Hey, my name is uh, Corey Alley, and it is an absolute joy to be with you guys here today. I was actually talking over there at the sign with Milo, and Roy came up to me and said, you must be the preacher. I said, well, how'd you know? He says, because you got a flannel shirt on. So <laughs> I am the preacher, and I do have a flannel shirt on. A little bit about me is my name is Corey Alley. I hail from the land of Concord, the land of Concord Mills, of Racing Capital USA, uh, I've been there for about 25 years off and on. I have a beautiful family. My wife's name is Betsy. I'm going to tell you a little story of how we got married. I have two children. Uh, my oldest is Noel. She's 13 years old, eighth grade, trying out for early college. Just had an all-district thing at camp for you, or band camp yesterday. And I have a, she's my quiet one. You know how like your kids are so different from one another. So she's my real quiet one. And then I have a rambunctious hellion called Eden. And uh, she gives me, uh, not grief, but she's just, she's, she's a pistol. And I'm grateful for both of them incredibly so much. And uh, it's just a true joy to be with you guys. I also pastor a church called Sojo, which is also in Concord. Yes, Sojo, S-O-J-O. We started off as Sojourner Church, but nobody in the South knew what a Sojourner was or how to pronounce it. So we had Sojourner, 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 right? so all that stuff. So we just shortened it to Sojo when the pandemic hit. Uh, I also work for this great place called Carolina Movement, and that's how I got introduced to your pastor. And so literally this morning I drove up early and I went to Nightdale, North Carolina, and celebrated with a church planner named Josh Howard who literally just started his church because of help like Potter's Hand, like you guys helped him launch that church last weekend. And then I drove nine minutes down the road to another church, uh, North Rogers Elementary School in uh, Southeast Raleigh and with Ed Davis who launched his launching literally right now as we speak Missio Day Church because of help from churches like you called Potter's Hand and then also send greetings from Concord from one of your guys as church planners literally Daniel Smith Daniel was with me and seriously like so this year I want to let you guys know what what God's doing in Daniel's life in Daniel's church they were running about 20 people about this time last year and now they're running 75. And so it's from help from churches like you. So literally, thank you from the bottom of my heart for the way that you guys support church planting, the way that you guys support Carolina Movement. And there's also Adam King that's right down the road from you guys that you guys support as well. So you guys are helping churches all across North Carolina. You probably didn't even know that, but let me remind you, like you guys are helping churches all across North, North Carolina. Can I get amen? So there's one more thing that I want to do, and that's honor your pastor. 20 years, you guys, 20 years, like in just a few months, like, wow, 20, 20 years. And how long has Pastor Matt been pastor since the whole 20 years? Because he started off associate, right? But he's been here the whole 20 years. So he must love y'all a lot. Um, 20, 20 years. And so, like... He's on a sabbatical. This is week three of his sabbatical. And so here are six ways that you can honor your pastor. Are you ready? Y'all don't sound ready. Oh. Is that a trick question? What? So here are six ways that y'all can honor your pastor. Are you ready? There you go. All right, number one, pray for him and his family. They're right here. Pray for him and his family. You guys supposed to clap for that. Every single one, you guys get clapped louder and louder. Just your way. Okay. You can grow in faith while he's not here. Like, you can read the Bible, you can worship, you can praise, you can... So when he gets back on 20 years, like, you guys are ready to go, right? Number three, you can continue... I know you guys already do this. Like, I literally watched, kind of just walked around. I can tell that the people who attend this church like each other. Like, literally, hearing stories of how long people have been here, um, it's just incredible. But seek unity, right? A church that's unified together will always be growing together. The devil cannot stop a unified church, so continuously seek unity. If you're new, get involved. Find a place to serve. Marin said kids ministry is a great place for you guys to serve right now. Yes, yes, get involved. Uh, invite your friends. It's a great church. This is a great, you guys got a gifted worship band up here, y'all. I'm just going to tell y'all. Like, I'm back there, like, singing Fur Foundation. Christ, I'm, like, going ham back there. You can ask the band, the, the, like, listen, he said, yes, I was going ham. Y'all got a great band. So uh, 
Invite people. You guys got a great pastor, a great staff, a great location, all that stuff. Don't forget to invite your friends. You know, 90% of people will come to church if you will simply say, hey, come to church and I'll take you to Los Trace after, after, lunch, after church service. Like, you want to buy me lunch? I'll go to church. Yes, yeah, so invite your friends. And last one, you guys clap the loudest for this one, right? You ready? Who's ready? Who's ready? Come on. I'm getting all Popeye on y'all. Give your money to this church. Tithe. Tithe. Yes, in the name of Jesus. Yes. It takes money to do mission. It takes money to plant these churches. It takes money to do all that God is doing here at Potter Sands. So please, please, man, make sure that we are giving, especially while our pastor is going. Because I'm going to tell you what, like being a lead pastor myself, that's the one thing that stresses me out the most is how are we going to pay for this? How are we going to pay for that? How are we going to take care of these people? And here's one way. The money that God needs is in this room if we will be obedient to what God tells us to do with it. So with that, I know I'm stepping on your toes now. It's not my sermon at all. I just want to pray. You guys can hang me later. Okay. <laughs> Father God, thank you for allowing me to be at Potter's hand. I pray, Jesus, God, you are our firm foundation. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would use me in a mighty mighty way this morning for every single man, every single woman, every single child in this room. Help me to be the representation of the Holy Spirit in their lives right here, right now. Hide me behind the cross. Allow me to speak truth and grace and love, Lord. Help me to point people to your son and God help people to see your son and God gravitate towards him. And let go of the burdens that we just sang about and pick up who Jesus is in our life and live in freedom and liberty because of who he is in our life. And if you agree with that, would you please say amen? amen. All right. I want to leave with one question. I know every single person in here has something that they need to pray about. There's something that you are asking God for in your life. Amen? There's something going on that you need God to move. And so that's the kind of the thought that I want to open up this sermon with. What is the one thing that you need God to do in your life? What is the one prayer that you're praying in your life right now? God, I need blank. What is that? Okay, so everybody got that? I want you to kind of hold that in your thoughts as I tell this story. It was the summer of 2006. If you were alive in 2006, raise your hand. Milo, where's your hand? <laughs> Summer of 2006, Johnny Depp, Orlando Bloom were the heartthrobs of our generation with this brand new movie called Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. $500 million it grossed in just three months, right? Then there was this girl. Nobody had ever heard of her before. Her name was Miley Cyrus, and she was starting this television show called Hannah Montana, and she blew up and became just the uber golden child of every mom and dad's dream right now, right? <laughs> All right, but Billy Ray did birth the mullet, so that makes everything okay. But in the summer of 2006, I was taking a trip to the southernmost state of India called Kerala, Kerala is like on the western side, not the eastern side, where the dynamic tsunami killed 100,000 people. I was going down there to teach and preach in villages and in seminaries, and I had been dating this little girl. Her name was Betsy Holloman, and I didn't know if I was going to marry this chick quite yet. And so I asked her to go on this mission trip, and she said, I hate flying. I don't like traveling. No. But after a few weeks of coercion, she said, okay, I want to join you on mission, Corey. And when she said, I want to join you on mission, I knew that she was the one, right? I knew that this was the lady that I wanted to marry. I knew that she was the girl that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. So I went to her father a week before we got on the plane. I said, dear Mr. Holloman, would you allow me to have your daughter's hand in marriage? And he asked me this question, are you sure? <laughs> and I was like, yes. Now I know what that meant a little bit later, but still, I still said yes. And so we take this 26-hour plane trip because we had to go from here to here to here and jet lag and the worst hotel experience of your life. And then we finally get to the hotel that we're staying in in the southern part of Kerala. And I told all the pastors that we're with, I'm going to ask Betsy to marry me. 
I'm going to ask Betsy to marry me. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be the most awesome thing. And literally, I remember I was standing in the doorway, and this pastor, his name was Tracy Caldwell, and he says this question that haunted me as soon as he said, I'm, I'm sure all you guys know where I'm going. I didn't know that. I was just like a man with a dream. Like I had no thoughts of anything else. He said these words. What if she says no? It's going to be awkward, dude. You're 6,000 miles away from home. I would never thought about that. I just assumed 100%, like, she's been with me. She's seen the worst of me. She's seen the best. She's going to say yes. And so for three days, this is the thought that pondered in my heart. What if she says no? I remember we went to this paradise kind of beach community where cruise ships would come in, and they had all these restaurants, and literally, I'm sitting there eating my food, which in India, if you're American, you probably ain't going to like the food a whole lot unless you just love Indian food, which I did not. But anyway... There we are eating food, and I'm just picking. Like, I don't want to eat anything. She's like, what is wrong with you? What's up with you? I said, nothing. Like, everything's fine. And then like an hour later, the sun had set, and there was a beautiful cruise ship coming in, and I got down on one knee, and I said, I love you. Explained to her how much I loved her, why I loved her, and then I popped out the ring, and I said, will you marry me? And these are the words that she said. Y'all ready? Shut up. <laughs> Legit. I'm not lying. I'm not making it up. You know how preachers like make up some stories sometimes. Like the fish was, no, she said, shut up. And she said, did you ask my dad? And I said, yes. And she was like, okay, good. Put the ring on. We're good. <laughs> and in October, it'll be 16 years since we've been married. But here's what I kind of want to come to you with. Yes. Yes. Here's what I want to kind of come to you with. The question that I want us to ponder. How many of us, if we're going to be honest in church, which we're all supposed to be honest in church, right? we got to tell the truth in church, right? Come on. How many of us have ever gotten into a situation where we are afraid to ask someone or something a question because we were afraid that that person was going to reject us, going to say no to us, and ultimately disappoint us, right? How many of you guys would be honest in church today say, I've been there before? So the rest of you guys, we need to have a counseling conversation about truthfulness in church, just so that we're aware. Like every single one of us have been in that situation. We just came out of a season of called Christmas. And how many of you guys, like I know, like not a lot of us have this anymore because we, we all stream stuff. But TBS for 24 hours plays a movie called what? A Christmas Story. A story about this young man named Ralphie and a coming to age story of how he wants a Red Rider BB gun with a compass and a stock. And he goes up to Santa Claus's mountain. As he's on Santa Claus's mountain, he looks at him and he says, I just want a football. And then he gets to the slide. He looks at Santa. He grabs a hold of the top slide. I want a Red Rider BB gun with a compass in the stock. And Santa looks at him and says, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. And puts his boot in his face. And here's the thing, church. Life has taught us that when we ask God for stuff, he puts his boot in our face. Mike Tyson had a quote that everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And life, let's be honest, I see some seasoned faces in here. Life has taught us that when we expect things, that when we believe things, when we hope for things, and those things don't come through, our expectations are let down, our hopes are let down, our dreams are let down. And so we stop dreaming, we stop hoping. We stop expecting. We stop believing. And that's exactly what I want to come against in this room today. I want to come against when the times that life has taught us not to ask God, not to believe God, not hope God, not dream, not to expect, not to believe. And I, and I just want to say, like, I think, I hope, I believe that we as God's people we, as God's people, should be the ones who hope the most, who believe the most, who expect the most. Because from what I, the side that I sit on, we serve the God of abundance. Yes, we serve the God who spoke the world into creation. The God who raises dead things to life. The God who heals blind men and women. The God who rescues the addicted. The God that rescues marriages. The God that redeems. The God that hopes. The God that dreams. And he's birthed his spirit inside of us. And so I might even say sometimes, I don't know if I'm going to go this far, but I'm going to try. It might just be downright sinful when we stop believing, when we stop hoping, when we stop dreaming. And I just want to ask, is that you today? 
that you've stopped expecting, that you've stopped believing, you stopped dreaming. And so here's the phrase I want you to leave. It is okay to ask. It is okay to ask. Jesus commands us to ask. We're going to get that in just a second. This is the phrase I want you to leave with today. It is okay to ask. It is okay to ask. Let me ask you a question. Who needs a promotion in this room today? It's okay to ask for a promotion. Who needs a new car? There's a curtain over here, curtain over here, curtain number one, <laughs> curtain number two. It's okay to ask. Who needs somebody in their life or a sickness or a disease to be healed? Man, raise them hands. Don't be like, uh, like, uh, uh, no, like, yes, that's me. I believe it's okay to ask. Uh, who is single and ready to mingle and needs a spouse? Raise them hands. <laughs> oh, come on, don't lie. All right, there's no single people in this room at all. Not one. I see a hand back there. I see a hand. All you single people start looking around. Yes, yes. It's okay to ask for a spouse. Who needs more cash? Now we, now we say, oh, yes, Lord. Yes. It's okay to ask. Who needs their business that they started this year, the last 10 years, to take off? Who else? Business to take off. Man, I believe it's okay to ask the Lord for my business to prosper. Who needs your child to get right? They left. Who? Yes, two hands. Some of y'all might put your feet up and your hands up. That's all of me. I got four of them. It's okay to ask. Now, this one might seem a little funny, but who needs your spouse to start picking up their underwear at the house? No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> My point is, I know that's kind of funny, but I want us to really lean in on this idea. Literally, we serve a God who's our Father, and it's okay to ask. And I believe there are certain things that we tell ourselves or we have questions about why we don't ask. Let me start off with the first one. But Corey, aren't there so many other people in this world that have it so much worse than I do? Yes, there are. But how many of you guys are moms and dads? Raise your hand if you're a mom or a dad. Does that stop you from giving a gift to your child? Because you also know that there are people who are worse off than your children. Did that stop anybody from putting presents underneath their tree this year? No. Why? Because you love your child. And God is a better father and a mother than any of us could ever be. And so it's okay for us to ask, even though there are people that have it much worse than me. Another one that we say, well, doesn't God just know everything already? So if he knows everything already, why should I ask in the first place? That's a great question. And yes, he does already know everything that you want and or need. But yes, at the same time, he still wants you to ask. Why? This is a hu human, earthly, but I'm a dad. And there are times I know exactly what my kids want and or need. But I still want them to come to me as their father to ask. Why? Because I want them to remember who the source of their life is. No, let me say it a different way. I want them to remember where their help comes from. And their help comes from me as their father. In the same way, our Heavenly Father knows that we need resources. Our Heavenly Father knows that we need resources. And that's why we're supposed to go to what? The source for our resources so that we will in turn know where our help comes from. So hear me. It's okay to ask. Now somebody's saying, well, what if I ask for the wrong thing? What if I ask for the wrong thing? That's a great question. What if you ask for the wrong thing? Well, let me say this first. At least you're asking. That means you're communing with the Father, you are communing with the one who created it all. And I believe that God is big enough that if you keep communing and you keep asking even for the wrong thing, that God is powerful enough to shape your prayers, to help you start praying for the right thing instead of the wrong thing. Can I get amen? Y'all do amens in church sometimes? What if God says no? Yes, ma'am. Can I be vulnerable with you guys? How many of you guys are, are watching football right now? Oh, come on. 
How many of y'all excited for 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8.30? Like, that's me. But I, I'm like a Panthers fanatic. So it can be borderline idolatry. I'm not even going to lie. Like, I, I love football, but I love the Panthers. So here, here's, I am being vulnerable here. The question is, is what if God says no? So two weeks ago, the Panthers are playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and if they win it, they got a chance for the playoffs. It's the fourth quarter. They're down by nine points, and I'm on my couch, and I'm doing this. Literally, Father God, please. I'm not lying. Like, this is shameful for me as a preacher to stand up and tell you guys, but I am literally saying, God, they have worked so hard. And what I'm really saying deep inside, God, I really just want to watch them play some more. And God said no. And this is what I've learned, exactly what you said, sister. That sometimes a denial is not a no, but it can be a delay. I mean, it's not time yet. And then another thing I've discovered, and through this particular example, when I'm praying for the Panthers, God's saying, I'm not going to bless something that's going to take you more and more away from me. God rarely is ever going to give you or bless you with something that you're asking for that's going to take you away from him and his presence. Now, here's a great question. I'm asking God, what if, what if the thing that I'm asking for, when I come into his presence, what if this requires me to change? Let me read it just like I wrote it. Coming to God is always going to require us to change. Now, notice what I said, coming to God. Once I've come to God, I'm always going to change because when I'm in his presence, he's going to change me. But I don't need to change to come to God. Can y'all hear me with that? Coming to God is always going to require me to change. But I don't need to change to come to God. Can I say that again? Can that preach in this house today? So many people say when you invite them to church, well, when I get this right, when I get that right, when I do this, then I'll get right with God. Like, no. Let God take control. Coming to God when I'm in his presence is always going to change me for the better, but that should never stop me from coming to God. The very definition of God is holy. And any time that we come into his presence, there is a revelation. And that revelation is that you nor I are anything like him. And in, in that revelation, when I'm revealed that I'm nothing like God when I see his holiness and I see my unrighteousness I want to repent and I want to change and let me say it like this if you don't want to change for the better then don't come to Christ what if he doesn't say a thing talking about this idea of asking what if God doesn't say a thing a delay is not a denial and I really believe the question is, is do we really want it so again, the questions that I've written today is, there are so many people out there who have greater needs than mine. That doesn't stop us from being God's children. Doesn't God know everything? Yes, he does, and that's why he wants you to come to him. What if I ask God for the wrong thing? At least you're asking, and God's powerful enough to change your prayer. What if God says no? Sometimes his rejection is for our protection. What if this requires me to change? Coming to God when I'm in God's presence is always going to require me to change. And what if he doesn't say a thing? That delay does not mean a denial. And so it's in this spirit that I want to come to you guys with Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. Luke chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. And so literally Jesus is teaching his disciples about this idea of prayer. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13 says this. And so I tell you, Jesus talking to his disciples. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Now, I'm a huge proponent of this phrase God keeps his promises. I believe our God is a promise keeper. And all throughout this phrase, I'm hearing promises given to us by our Father. That if you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Now he tells a story about us as moms and dads. He says, if you fathers, 
If your children ask for a fish, now I know nobody's kid asked for a fish. They might ask for a fishing rod, but they didn't ask for a fish. Do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people, and again, this is Jesus talking. If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And I want you to kind of lean into that last phrase. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This comes on the heels of Jesus telling a story about a friend coming to him late at night asking for bread. Now I want to ask you guys a question. If you had a friend who came to your house at midnight, knocked on your door when you were already in your PJs, whatever it is that you wear to go to bed with, would be very excited to see you, said friend. Raise your hand if you'd be excited. This one guy back here, he's a teenager, mind that, okay? It's fine, I don't care. Two o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning. I'm not six o'clock though. If he came at six o'clock, you might be mad, right? No, not, not at six o'clock, but late, good, early, no, right? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Jesus tells this story, and he's telling the story for a reason. The guy ends up getting the bread, not because they're friends, but because of his persistence. And the last question that I asked was simply this. What if God doesn't answer right away? And I believe that there is a secret that Jesus is trying to tell us. Let, let's let's kind of go through this first thing. His instructions to us, not even his instructions, but he gives us a command. Parents, if you give your child a command, what do you mean? You mean for them to do something. You are telling them, not asking them. Jesus gives a command, and so I tell you, keep on asking. So I tell you, so I want you to hold that thing right there, that command, in relation to what I said in the very first part of this message. How many of us need something from the Father? And almost everyone raised their hands because all of us are asking God for something. Listen to the commands of our Savior. And so I tell you, keep on asking. He's telling us not to give up. Now be honest with yourself, not with the room. But how many of you guys have stopped literally getting on your knees or however it is that you posture yourself in a place of worship saying, I am nothing, you are everything, and I'm asking you, please. Not like riding down the road and saying, oh, hey, God, hey, um, yeah, I was just thinking about you. And, you know, if you could really do this, that would be doing me a solid. Like, no, like, how many of us are worshiping our Father in prayer and asking Him, asking Him? I believe that many of us, if we're honest, that for whatever reason have stopped asking God, Maybe it's laziness. Maybe it's pridefulness. Maybe it's disobedience. Maybe just maybe it's disappointment. Got punched in the face way too many times and I'm scared to ask God again because he might tell me no. Whatever your reason, I believe that we are missing out on the greatest blessing. And the greatest blessing is not him answering our prayer. The greatest blessing is knowing that he's in our corner. Whatever your reason that you stopped asking in a way that really pleases the Father, we're missing out. Not just the answer to prayer. The answer to prayer is great, but knowing that God was with me because guess what's going to happen when God answers that prayer? Not if, right? When God answers that prayer, not if. When God answers that prayer, there's going to be another prayer that comes. There's going to be another situation. There's going to be another trial. There's going to be another obstacle. And knowing that God was in my corner then gives me faith that God's going to be in my corner now. And we're missing out on the presence and the knowledge of who He is and that it's okay to ask. Look at this promise. I tell my kids, like, from the age of, like, 18 months, 
18 months, I started telling my kids a few key sayings. And the first one was this, Jesus is God. As an 18-month-year-old, they started talking a little bit. They could re repeat that phrase, Jesus is God. I've got Jesus is, and they say God. And then they started to say Jesus is God. But the second one was this, that God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. Why is that so daggone important to me? Because I know that life is hard. Can I please get an amen to Potter's house? Life is hard. Things happen. And when those things happen, the clouds come and we forget that even though the clouds are there, that the sun's still shining. The sun never stops shining. God never stopped keeping his promises. God never promised that everything was going to be sunshine and rainbows. Jesus told us, there's going to be trouble. But take heart, I have what? Overcome the world. He promised us hard times were coming. But in those hard times, we could come to him and lean on him and trust in him because he's a God who keeps his promises. Look at the promise. Jesus says, I tell you. This is the guy who raised people from the dead. This is a Jesus, the guy who spit in somebody's eye and he could see. This is the God who touched people and they, their leprosy was gone. When he told people, people believed that. And sometimes we forgot that that's who he is. That he is a miracle worker, a promise keeper, a light in the darkness. And he's telling us, keep on asking. And you will receive. That's a promise. What do you need from God today? What's your prayer? What's your hope? What's your dream? What's your expectation? And then he says this for everyone, not the perfect one. Are you a child of God? If you're a child of God, this promise is for you. For everyone who asks what? Say it. Say it, Potter's hand. For everyone who asks what? Say it again. Now, in Potter's hand, who needs to receive something from the Father? So if you ask, you'll receive. And then he says this, he tells this little parable. He says, so if you, regular people, he says the word sinful, and I know it's kind of like cringy in 2023, but that's what we are. I am a sinful being. That's why I needed a savior. You are sinful beings. That's why we all need a savior together. We are not perfect. We are broken people. He says, so if you sinful, broken people, you know how to give good, good gifts. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit? Now, why the Holy Spirit? What's, what's the deal with the Holy Spirit? Why not? Why did he say, give me what I'm asking for? Yes, ma'am. It's the power. I said this, the Holy Spirit gives me the wisdom. The Holy Spirit gives me the strength. The Holy Spirit gives me the faith, the heart, the knowledge, the resources to see what I'm asking for accomplished. Because sometimes God's asking me to ask. But then he's telling me to seek. And then he's telling me to knock. At some point, I've got to take a physical action as well. The Holy Spirit gives me the wisdom, the strength, the faith, the heart, the knowledge, the resources to see what I'm asking for accomplished. So let me ask Potter's hand a question. Do you believe God keeps his promises, yes or no? Let me, let me ask that one more time. Does Potter's hand believe that the God of the universe, whose son's name was Jesus, who went to the cross, rose from the dead, do we believe that that God keeps his promises, yes or no? Yes. What I think happens a lot of times in our lives is we know this here, and it's easy to say yes here. But when life does punch me in the face, saying yes here is harder. So how do we go from a head knowledge of, yes, of course I know, I've read the Bible, I've heard all the stories, till whenever I get the news from my doctor that cancer has come. Or my kid is raising H-E double hockey sticks out there and I don't know what's going to happen. Or there's way too many days or months and there is money 
to take that head knowledge and turn it to a heart knowledge that knows that my God is going to see me through. How do we go from our head? How do we go from our hearts? And then ultimately, how do we go to our hands, which is going to allow us to take action? I believe it's through prayer. Because prayer is the place where I experience the love of the Father. And when I experience the love of the Father, when I know that he's in my corner, even when everything is stacked against me, I can still believe. And what do we do the worst? Pray. But where do you need the help of God the most? Hebrews chapter 4 says this. So then, since we have a great high priest whose name is Jesus, since we have a great high priest who has entered into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us, the people of God, hold firmly to what we believe, that God keeps his promises. This high priest, not like a Catholic priest, not like the high priest of the Jews, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He understands what I'm going through, the loneliness, the hurt, the challenges that I face. Why? Because he faced all of them. And it says, yet he did not sin. So, so, so let us come boldly to the throne. And this morning, this altar is the throne. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There are so many of us who have things that we need God to do. And this is what the word is telling us to do. So come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And at the throne there, we will receive what? His mercy. And we will find grace. Grace to help us where we need it the most. Maybe you're asking God for this, but God has something deeper and better for you. Listen, there at the throne, you are going to receive His mercy and you will find His grace to help us where we need it the most. Listen to the commands. Come boldly, without restraint, with confidence. And that's where we struggle, that God, is God really going to hear me? Is God really going to listen? Does God, is God really there? The word says, come boldly. Here's the promise. There we will receive. What are we going to receive? We're going to receive gifts. And what are his gifts? Gift number one is mercy. Mercy is getting what we do not deserve. Mercy is getting what we do not deserve. The first gift is mercy. I deserve death and hell. Corey Alley deserves death and hell. That's what I deserve. The life that I live pre-Jesus and even the life that I live during Jesus, I still deserve life. I still deserve hell and death. I'm sorry. But what he gives me is grace. And grace is God's unmerited favor. It is my cup constantly overflowing. To see what God has done in my life in comparison to who I was pre-Jesus is an incredible, miraculous story. I didn't even give you guys my testimony. And it says that when you receive his mercy and when you receive his grace, it says he's going to give it to us where we need it the most. So where do you need God the most this morning, church? He's made a promise. He's made a promise, and this word says that he is our great high priest, and this high priest is literally at the right hand of God. He's got God's ear, church. Where do you need God the most this morning, church? There is a great high priest who understands exactly how you feel. He knows what you're going through. He knows the emotions deep within your heart, and he's asking you to come boldly to his throne. He's asking every single one of us to come boldly to his throne. He is the great high priest, and he's got the ear of God, the one who can literally snap his fingers and make everything change. And he tells us to ask. So will you ask this morning, what is it that you need from the Father the most? Will you do what Jesus is telling us to do? Keep on 
asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking because the promise is that when you seek, you will find. When you knock, the door will be open. And if you ask, you will receive. That's not my words. This has nothing to do with me. This has everything to do with him and what he's already done. Everything that you're asking for, he's already seen it finished. He simply wants to show you how he's going to do it. That's why he wants you to commune with him. Let me show you how I'm going to move. Let me show you how to believe. Let me show you how to dream. Let me show you how to hope. So will you stand with me this morning? Stand with me this morning, church. There is not one person that does not come needy this morning. How many of us will ask? Whether you sit at your seat or come down to this altar, how many of us will ask? How many of us will humble ourselves like Chronicle tells us? If we humble ourselves, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways, he will hear us and heal our land. He will grow this church like we've never seen it before. The 20 years after the first 20 years will be better than it ever could be. The things that we're going through, he is going to see it through and not just see it through. He's going to let us thrive. So, Lord God, I leave it in your hands. I pray that I've been faithful to your word, that I've honored Pastor Matt and his family. God, that I've honored every single person in this church and that we would come to you now in whatever way that we need to come to you, God. There is not one person that does not need to come to you. It's just a matter of how. And so, Lord, I leave this time now in your hands and ask that you would move in every single heart, in every single mind, in every single hand, that you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine according to the work that is within us in God's church, Lord. And so move in the heart. So today, church, I'm asking you to ask the Lord where you need it most. I'm asking you if you feel so bold to come down to the throne and get on your knees and ask a holy God for the help that you need. If you're not able to get on your knees and sit down at your chair and ask a holy God for what you need, but that nobody would leave this place without taking time to commune with the Father the maker of the heavens and the earth, to simply say, I am yours and you are mine. You are the source and I need a resource. God, show me the way. And to claim what your son Jesus taught us, if we'll seek, we will find. If we'll knock, the door will be open. If we ask, we will receive. So I leave it in your guys' hands this morning. As we sing, as we worship, if you feel led, come down to this altar and leave your request there honor the father there if you need to sit at your seat but commune with god in this place in jesus name i pray